everyone. Welcome back to Tuesdays with Tuesday. I'm Tuesday and I'll be reading you today the next chapter from my book, Taste, which is book one in the Tearaway series. Tearaway has nine books, but we're going to read book one together and see how you like it. If you like it, you can finish the series. If not, you can check out one of my other videos where I read to you one chapter at a time from one of my books. So this is Taste by Mary E. Toomey, which is my fantasy name, but my real name is Tuesday, so you can call me whatever you like. I've got, <laughs> I've got Cricket with us again because she likes to snuggle when I read. So we'll see how this goes. And I have a bunny over there, Giovanni Ribizzi, and he is making a meal out of his carrot. So I apologize for the background noise, but that's what happen. That's what happens when you live in a zoo. So enjoy. Chapter nine, friggin' chiropractor. The hairs on my arm stood as we neared the front door. It had been left open, but before Ezra could pull me behind him to shield me from things I surely wasn't meant to see, I glimpsed the upturned, bare, muddy feet of a woman sticking out over the threshold. What the? My exclamation was cut short when the door swung further open to reveal a cloaked bodybuilder with dreadlocks. He was standing over the body of an unconscious woman with his dark hood pulled back revealing a fierce and determined face. He had a half-inch short brown beard cropping his stern jawline, thick eyebrows, and an unyielding gaze that seemed to see nothing but my horror. The down-on-her-look woman, sprawled on the floor at his feet, was dressed in what looked like a tattered gray wizard's robe. Her brown skin was covered in mud. I wanted to take another look at her to see if I could help in some medical way but the dude was standing over her, and he was no joke. Mason, good to see you, son, Ezra forced a smile, but I could tell he didn't want me conversing with whatever elf, vampire, viking dude Mason was. Six and a half feet of solid muscle greeted me with a cold stare. I took in his cool gray eyes that studied me every bit as much as I scrutinized him. Dude had hairy forearms, thicker than even the rock had a right to walk around with. He had seven long dreadlocks tied together with a leather lace, holding his hair back from the face that was handsome in that I just ripped open a lion with my teeth kind of way. My spine tingled with an ominous desire to bolt. Delusional or not, Danny had invited this mason guy here to try and break my arm. I didn't think I believed in vampires. But I sure as Sunday believed in oversized bodybuilders who might attack me. Mason motioned to me as I took a step backward. This is her? This is the new omen? Mason, this is not the time. We're handling it, Ezra barked, turning from the British ward cleaver to, I don't know, someone meaner. I took another step back, almost to the edge of the porch. Mason smelled my flight seconds before I bolted. The only advantage I had was that I was still outside of the house but I decided that was the only advantage I needed. I turned and leapt off the porch, hitting the concrete walkway at a run I was well prepared for. I was a decent sprinter, even speedier when I was being chased. I'd watched my fair share of horror movies, so I knew better than to look behind me, but the desire was there when I heard Ezra shouting my name into the early graces of the evening. My arms pumped when I heard the heavy footfalls of a two-person stampede coming up behind me. I didn't know where I was going. I had no car and no knowledge of the area, so I ran, kicking up the dust behind me, hoping they'd choke on it. I charged down the open road, wishing I hadn't been fooled into thinking the fact that there were no other mansions on the street was impressive instead of ominous. There was no one to help me, no one to call the cops, no one to see Danny grab at my arm, brushing his fingers to my skin to warn me that he was closing in. So I did what any normal person would do in a situation where escape was impossible. I let out my air in a gust, stopped dead in my tracks when I felt his arm again, tucked down slightly, and braced myself for the impact. In my imagination, I would be low enough and Danny unstoppable enough that he would fling over my body and slam himself into the pavement. In my imagination, I'm also nine feet tall and built like a truck which isn't totally true to real life. As it turns out, getting hit by Danny was much like getting smashed by a freight train, given his considerable bulk. 
I was jolted more than I anticipated, but managed to hold my ground as Danny toppled over my hunched body. The fall knocked a defeated poof out of him when he hit the pavement with a thud. I couldn't even work out a triumphant suck it to Danny since Mason was only a handful of paces behind him. I didn't have time to build up enough speed to escape the Viking. His seven dreadlocks flew out behind him like flags of doom. I didn't have anyone who might come to my aid. All I had was me, and I wasn't sure that was enough, even on a normal day. Instead of running, I kept my knees bent and my body checked, and, and body checked Mason's pelvis, lifting his legs when he collided with me. I dug my shoulder into him as he doubled over and used his forward momentum to launch him over me in a mid-air somersault. It was the classic using his size against him tactic, and Mason was a big fella. That seemed like the appropriate time to work out a good dig, but Danny was starting to assemble his bearings. So I took my head start and bolted for the open road. Stupid Danny for latching onto my ankle just enough to make me stumble like a dummy. Stupid me for going through all that trouble of throwing them both down, only to lose it in the final inning by tripping over a technicality. My hands kissed the concrete, but Danny still didn't let go of my leg. I rolled onto my back and kicked at him, cursing internally when Mason rose to his feet, fixing me with a glower that told me Danny was tired of playing around. Don't break my arm, I shouted, holding my loose fist up to block whatever blows might rain down on me. Mason was unwashed and looked like a mountain man or Viking warrior or something. Mason's fingers curled up into a tight fist and my heart raced. I won't leave this place until I can bring good news back to my father's people. We can't wait any longer. If it's you, you'll be awakened this very night. Huh? Dude, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm already awake. Let me go and we're cool. Mason towered over me. The intimidation factor I tried not to feel hit me at a new level. You're not going anywhere. The hairy arms that reached for me were too strong for me to win against, but I wasn't about to quit now. I punched and kicked, even as Mason's thick hands wrapped around my left wrist, lifting me to stand. It wasn't my first time being grabbed at by a huge man. It wasn't my twentieth time. I didn't pull my punch when my fist flung out and clocked him with my right hook. Fear rose up in me, but I punched him again in the same spot twice more before I debated the benefits of cowering. I knew what cowering got a girl. I spat in his eyes, which was the only way I could get him to loosen his iron grip on my arm that made my wrist feel like it might splinter. Danny's arms wrapped around me from behind, securing my thrashing body while Mason wiped my spit from his eyes. Would you hold still? Danny gritted his teeth through my stomp on his instep. Mason wrested me from Danny, flinging me over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. I hate this maneuver, I raged, pounding on Mason's lower back with my fists. This is humiliating. Mason's voice was steady. Now, now, you were such a sweet little thing last night when you, last week when you rolled out of your car all scared. I don't know where you get all this rage from. From you! You're taking me against my will with the purpose of breaking my arm, you jackhole. You want me to just go quietly so I can still be a sweet little thing? Mason and Danny sat back toward the mansion, their contraband immobilized. They marched down the street and up the driveway, not stopping until they crossed the threshold. Danny locked the front door as Mason deposited me with surprising gentleness on the floor of the foyer, ignoring Ezra's warnings of them going too far. Mason's voice was low and even, not even out of breath, the jag. This ends tonight, Ezra. I'm not leaving until we know whether or not you've finally found a new omen for us. Mason met my glare as I tried to right myself. Are you quite finished trying to dodge your duties? What are you talking about? Dude, you carry me like that ever again and you don't want to know the problem I can be. Mason tilted his head to the side. She's a feisty one. Almost got away from me. He held up his hands to try and convince me they were innocent when we both knew they were not. All right, I won't need to grab at you if you stay where we can see you. My mouth popped open as I gaped at him. I think you've got me confused with someone else. Someone you can try to intimidate and jerk around. The exit was only a few feet away, but Viking Bob was standing like a linebacker, blocking it. Ezra pointed to the front door, his upper lip curling in a faint sneer that made me recoil. 
You'll not put your hands on her, Mason. I'll handle this in my own way, in my own time. I wasn't sure what my plan of escape should be, but I knew I didn't want to stick around to see which of the two men had the biggest temper. I slowly inched away from the argument, hoping I could find a back door and slip away into the night. I warned you, Mason called out, and in the next second, his hands turned into weapons again. We're doing this now, Ezra. I was wrestled to the floor, screaming when Mason kneeled with all his weight on a sensitive spot on my spine. Stop it, stop it, I wailed. He had my hands behind my back and jerked on them with brutal force. Ow! I kicked to no avail, trying to turn myself over so I could get him off my spine. Mason's voice was deep and steady, as though he was walking through the steps on how to change a tire. It was his calm that made me panic the most. That he could pin a girl to the ground with all the inflection of a patient flight attendant made my blood run cold. I fought with everything in me for an escape. I know this feels like a hot knife in your spine, and I don't want to hurt you, but you can't go anywhere. Ezra's voice rose above the others. Not her spine. What if you're wrong? Her arm, Mason. Try breaking her arm if you must. I fumed at Ezra. I knew you were too good to be true. Mason was unperturbed, focused only on breaking my back like the worst friggin' chiropractor in the world. You'll stay here, or I'll make this even more painful. Nod if you understand. Bite me! My face was red with fury at being dominated by the mountain man. I squirmed as best I could, but he had me so pinned that for all my thrashing, I barely moved. My eyes locked in on the woman in gray, tattered robes who was still lying on the hardwood floor, eyelids shut, as though in a deep sleep. The gashes and bruises peppering her body were what I feared might be in store for me next. I bucked with renewed vigor, hoping my inner Bruce Campbell would save the day. Have it your way. Mason, stop. You'll kill her, Ezra commanded. Mason didn't stop. He dug his knee deeper into the side of my spine and then jerked my chin upward with his free hand. I like to pretend my job's no big deal, but working in a prison comes with a certain level of danger you just plain get used to. I've been stabbed twice while on the job, and I'll never forget the feeling of the shiv slicing into my thigh, or the one that cut my arm, forcing me to never wear tank tops in front of Ollie ever again so he didn't find out and freak. I still recalled with perfect clarity the sharp pain that started at the entrance and echoed up my body long after the shiv was removed. The lasting agony of those stabbings paled in comparison to Mason playing a game of chicken on my spine. White-hot torment ricocheted up my back and spread out to each connected nerve ending. He had my chin jerked up so I couldn't take in a full breath. While I tried to gasp out a scream, he was slowly suffocating me. I knew beneath the never-ending torture that the pain was a tool to asphyxiate me, at least enough to deflate my, fight, my flight. So I gritted my teeth through the pain, praying no lasting damage would be done to my spine. Mason kept my wrists confined with one of his two large hands at the base of my spine, while the other thumbed my chin in a hang-in-there kind of way that utterly confused me. You're a spirited one. Are you ready to calm down yet? I'm ready to kick your ass, I shot back, my intimidation factor compromised by so many things in that moment. Danny and Mason exchanged a look of doom, and I knew Danny was giving Mason silent permission to mess me up a little more. Vaughn, no, he's got it under control, Danny shouted, and before I knew it, a red t-shirt came whipping by my blurred vision. Mason released me, and my chin cracked hard into the floor, making my eyes water. Vaughn and Mason were sh raped were scrapping on the floor, with Mason being the clear victor only a few seconds later, though it didn't look like either competitor really wanted to hurt the other. I tried to army crawl away with shaking arms, but I was in too much lingering pain. Ezra rolled me over and scooped me up in his arms like a baby, bending my spine back the right way, which somehow started the ripping agony all over again. Danny, get Mason out of here, Ezra called over his shoulder. I am the ambassador to the top side. I decide how quickly things get done, not you. I'll not be bullied by the council. Mason was irate as he shook Vaughn off him. The people are dying. You can't keep ignoring them. Danny, make him understand. Hayop is going to cave and consent 
to using Sama's rations if something doesn't change soon. It's only a matter of time before we bow to Sama. Is that what you want? Ezra whirled on Mason, making me seasick as I fought to take in a full breath without crying or letting my misery be known. Do you think I take lightly what the mantle of the omen has done to my daughter? Everyone's so quick to sacrifice someone else's child so long as it's not their own. How about this one? Will you sentence her so easily? He gripped me with what could only be described as a protective hold, cradling me mid-air like I was five and skinned my knee. And he was Ollie, come to rescue me. I'll not force her into anything, and I'll not show her the heartlessness of our world until I'm sure she's the one. Mason shook his head, the ends of his long dreads swinging out to shame Ezra. You've lost sight of what's important. One life is nothing compared to the hundreds of thousands she could save. And I just tested her spine. If she were a normal girl, it would have snapped. She's the one, Ezra. You're just stalling because you're afraid to drag her into this life. I was still debating between clocking Ezra and clinging to him as my only beacon in the sea of insanity that was storming around me. One life, Ezra simpered. Please, how many omens did the last topside ambassador go through before there was only Mary Ang barely left standing? How many daughters have died? Mine won't be next, he roared, vicious in his fury. And this child won't put her name on that death certificate until she understands what she'll be getting herself into. Mason was livid as he gestured to the supine form of the woman he'd dragged into the mansion. I brought her body from Tearaway so the girl could be awakened. Let's get to it. Ezra ignored Mason and turned to the others. Vaughn, take October Grace to the living room and see that she's okay. If she needs a doctor, call one. Danny stepped forward. I can take her. You, Ezra sneered, looking down his nose at Danny, like you can be trusted when it comes to Mason. The two of you. In this, I trust Vaughn more than I do you. Think on that, young man. Danny clenched his fists and stepped back. Vaughn was hesitant. Are you sure you trust me, Ezra? Ezra nodded once. She's not bleeding. You'll be fine. Vaughn smiled at me like the whole thing was a shrug-worthy offense. A little tense in here, yeah? I've got you, November. Ezra handed me off to Vaughn. It was bad enough I'd indulge myself as long as I did in the father fatherly protection. But I wasn't about to be helpless in Vaughn's arms to boot. No more men are carrying me, you hear? I stated my demand. The second I put weight on my legs, my knees began to buckle. I hated myself for the whimper that escaped my lips, and even more when Vaughn caught me and hefted me up in his arms like a damsel in distress. How about just this once? Vaughn offered like a gentleman. Was no damsel. I was humiliated, so I buried my face in his shirt and tried to hide my shame. I could feel the hot sting of tears rising up in me, and I knew I could never live with myself if I cried in front of the brutal men. Bathroom, I requested. Anything you say, darling. And that ends chapter nine. We got a visit from Winter Wonderland, the, the white fur cat. Um, his full name is Winter Wonderland Peanut Butter. Um, but when I'm cross with him, his name is Winter. So, I hope you join me next Tuesday for the next chapter of Tuesdays with Tuesday of the book Taste. Thank you for spending time with me today. I'll see you next week.